So um, topic 11 and 21 is kind of analytical chemistry, but I wanted to focus on the organic analytical chemistry first, and then we'll talk about kind of the basic data analysis um, second. And so the first thing we're going to talk about is mass spectroscopy. Okay. And mass spectroscopy uses the masses of molecules and their fragments to determine possible structural features. So mass spectroscopy is essentially kind of physics. It's using a sample of molecules and it's accelerating it through um, a mass spectrometer and some of the particles will make it all the way through and de detect a certain mass. Other ones will break up. And so like you might have something like, let's say you have a, a molecule that weighs 88, okay? When you go through the mass spectrometer, you are gonna get some fragments that are 88 maybe some fragments that are, I don't know, 43, and maybe some fragments that are like 29 in there. So, so a whole sample of, of a molecule that weighs 88, you'll get different fragments that break off during the process and you'll get different amounts of each of those masses and so oops sorry let me put yeah sorry 88 grams per mole is our um our kind of concept here right so um we're assuming that's the so that's the thing because when this spectrometer produces these peaks of these masses the largest one we call our molecular ion peak. And what that tells you is the molecular mass of the species, okay? So the largest mass is the one that we always use to guide us to the molecular formula. It's these other fragments that are produced in other molecules of that sample that help us identify what's present and what's not present in the structure, okay? Now, for example, you might see something like, I don't know, something like this. Oh, yeah, sure. Actually, you know, what? let me change it a little bit just so it's a little more distinctive. Something like this. Okay. And when it fragments, you could get... this and make a note now every mass spectrometry fragment is a positive ion okay the fragments you lose are not positive but the fragments that are produced are always positive that's a kind of a byproduct of the process that this goes through so if they ask you what fragment is producing that peak you have to write a positive charge on it or you'll get it wrong okay so make sure you write that positive charge but there's also a possibility that some of the fragments might produce something like this. So some of the molecules that go through there might break off and produce something like that. And other molecules might break off and produce this. So these fragments are kind of what you're trying to figure out in this process because they don't tell you all these fragments. You have to kind of figure this out based on the information that's provided to you in the mass spectrum. So that's what mass spectra is doing. One, it tells you the molecular mass of the, of the species. And two, it helps you go, okay, this peak is probably because of this structure and it doesn't have, or this mass spectra doesn't have this peak, so it can't be this structure. So it helps you kind of eliminate structures and allow possibilities. And luckily you don't have to do all that math because the IB does provide you a chart. Oops. in the data booklet that has 
the major values that you need to be familiar with in these fragments that are lost. Now notice they're also deliberate when they write fragments lost, they don't write a positive charge because they expect you to know that the fragment that is shown is a positive charge. So like, again, it's the IB giving you information, but not giving you enough that you can just use the data booklet to solve all your problems without understanding what the information is giving you. And so you notice here, like, for example, this molecule here, this is propanoic acid, and it's what, 36, 42, um, so 74 grams per mole. Okay. In this structure, you would see a peak at 74, and you'd also see a peak at 45, and you'd see a peak at 29. Now, the height of the peak really isn't that important for us right now. The height of the peak kind of tells you like how strong the fragment, like how stable the fragment is, but that's really not a kind of a huge concern of ours right now. But analyzing the gaps between the mass of the fragments helps you go, okay, I probably lost. So for example, here, if I knew this structure, and I got 45. Well, that 45 peak is a um, COOH minus, which means you lost a CH3, CH2. And the CH3, CH2 means you lost a COOH. So understanding that relationship between the fragment. So this would be the fragment shown. And this is the fragment lost when that occurs in the mass spectra. Oops. Yeah, so the mass is going to be on the x axis. So when you see this, oh, sorry, give me a second to write this down. Yes, Laura? No. So that's a good question. So if they ask you what's lost, you just write that structure just like they do in the table here. It's only when they say, which name the structure that's responsible for this peak or that shows this peak at 45, you'd write COOH positive. And the Mars team is instructed to deduct one point throughout your entire paper if you don't do it. So, like, you don't get penalized twice if you had to do it twice, but it's still a point you lose. So, like, they don't do double jeopardy there, but it's still one point overall if you miss it once or twice. Yes. So that a bond has been broken and only positive ions make it to the end of the mass spectrometer. That's the key idea. Like they're ionized and only those positive ones bend around the structure and then get detected. So like Matthew was saying, what you'll have here is you'll have like kind of abundance and then you'll have M over Z. And M over Z is just mass to charge ratio, but the charge we're just going to assume is positive one every time. We're not going to get super complicated into this. So you're going to see a peak at 74. You'll see a peak at 45. You'll see a peak at 29. And again, the heights don't really matter here. And the IB will clean this up so you don't really have like isotopes and like losing an H here and there. Because you might have a peak at 73 technically, but it's really not important to our entire structure. It's obvious whenever you lose one, it's an H. So it's not really a challenge to deduce what's causing that. And generally speaking, the fragments happen around like the C double bond O's that are in structures. So usually those things in the CO bonds are where kind of around where those fragments happen. So kind of here is a weak one. Technically here's a weak one as well, but it just doesn't seem to be as abundant. But for this one, especially propanoic acid, like for example, if I pull up Let's see. I guess this one would kind of be it. But so this is more, let's see, we'll put this in here. Okay. Well, I guess so that was kind of the bond breaking here as well. And so let's see. Okay, did it paste?
I don't think it copied. Like you could see this is propanoic acid here. And we did say that there was, oh, I'll say it. Yeah, I don't know why there's a 28 here. That's kind of a strange one, but, uh, so you do see the peaks at 74 and 45. The 28 one, I'm trying to figure out why that would be the case here. Because, yeah, I don't know why you'd lose two fragments, though. Like, 57 makes sense because this is loss of 17, which is an OH. So that makes sense. I'm not sure why that 28 is necessarily there because, like, Because this whole thing is 29. Yeah, like, like I don't think it would be as complicated here because, like, you'd have to break off, like, like the only thing that's really 28 is C dob on O. So, like, both parts are breaking off. But for the IB, they're going to keep things pretty simple, and you're only going to have, like, one break each time. So I doubt you'd see a 28 here if they were giving you the propanoic acid mass spectra. And so that's kind of really strange here. But – you kind of get the idea of these peaks here. And so like what I see the IB doing is giving you something like, I don't know, something like, C4H8O as your molecular formula. And what they might do is give you a mass spectra like this. Okay. And they'll have something like, let's see, what, 48, 56. Um, wait, on, 56, 72. Right, 48, 56. Yeah, 72. And they might have something like, Forty-three. Why would you have? To... Yeah, something like this. And what you kind of have to understand here is that there's only certain structures that are C4H8O. Now, I was talking to um, some students in the tutorial about this. When you see C4H8O, okay. Notice how you don't have the maximum number of hydrants here. There's less hydrants than you have maximum. It's not saturated. So there's a double bond present here. And what that double bond usually is, because we can only have fun, one function group, is a C double bond O. So when you start seeing hydrants that are less than the maximum, there's going to be st start having double bonds here. And when you have an O, that double bond is between the C and the O here, because the IB limits you to the possibilities for your structures here. So you, you kind of come up with a limited number of possibilities here. You could have it as an aldehyde. You could have it as a ketone. Actually, those are the only two now that I think about it. Because if you put it on the other side, it's the same thing. So you only have two possible structures here. And this is something that IB would do because, okay, they're like, okay, you don't have to come up with seven isomers. It's just two isomers and having to distinguish between which one's which. So you have two possible structures for this, okay? And so you start looking at, okay, where are fragments going to break around that C double bond O? And so what we see here, we look at our structure here and we say, okay, there's a loss of 29 here. Well, a loss of 29, according to our chart, is either a CHO or a CH3, CH2. Okay. Oh, I hope I didn't make this. So. Oh, I think I just made. Uh, I think I just realized that both these could somewhat follow this, but I'll I'll, I'll say this that there's something missing here that 
it would be kind of obvious here. But so, and if you go from here to here, you lose 43, okay? And 43 could be a CH3, CH2, CH2. Or I guess technically a CO, CH3. I did not do this very well. I did not plan this out very well. Because I would say that this would be a little challenging because both of them kind of have the same fragments that are present. Now, what I would say is if I had to choose this, this would also have a 15 fragment that's not present in this one, okay? So I guess if I added a 15 here, oh, sorry. I guess that would help my problem here. Because if I have a 15 here, that fragment can only be a CH3 plus fragment. And if you notice, the aldehyde has no CH3 that can break off because only fragments that can break off are near those kind of weaker or more stable double bonds of carbon to oxygen. So this doesn't have a CH3 fragment. This one does. And so by looking at these structures and going, okay, do I have a CH3, CH2 here? Yeah, I could lose this. Could I lose this and end up with just CH3 or CH2? Yes. What's this 15? That's if I lose this and then I have a CH3 left. So by using this mass spectra, I can eliminate possible structures and deduce that this structure must reflect this isomer. Yeah. So it's really about doing the math. Yes, Laura. Sure. When, when, when fragments are broken up, they generally break up near carbons that have the ability to stabilize based on like double bonds with O because the O helps stabilize it. So in this aldehyde here, this CH3 on the left is not going to break off because the C to C bond is too strong. Only CH3s that are near C double bond O's have the ability to break off as fragments. So yeah, no C to C bond is ever going to break um, like in an alkane form, like a CH3, CH2, CH2. That, that's not gonna break off into CH3 and then CH3, CH2. It's only really about around that area where the acetyl bond O is that you're gonna likely see fragments being formed. And this mass spectra also reinforces the fact that that's our molecular formula because C4H8O adds up to 72. Now, if the mass were 144, then the molecular formula would be twice C4H8O, right? Because it'd be twice the mass of that formula. I wouldn't tell you it's molecular formula, then that'd be confusing. But I'd say the empirical formula, this is C4H8O, what's the molecular formula? If it's 72, it's the same formula. If it's 144, then it's c 8 H16O2. So you do have to use that large, largest value to figure out the molecular formula from this. Okay. Questions about that? So what is a mass spectra used for? To one, calculate the molecular formula, and two, help you identify possible fragments and help you eliminate possibilities of isomers based on the fragments that are formed or lost in this. Really, that's all analytical chemistry is. It's just kind of a puzzle. And each type of analysis gives you different information toward reaching the conclusion of the structure. Questions? Let's go on to IR spectroscopy. Okay. IR spectroscopy uses IR radiation 
that can be absorbed by bonds in an organic molecule. Now, when you talk about this in college, you're going to get much more in-depth about what kind of um, reaction the molecule has to um, the absorbance of that IR. Sometimes it's a stretch where the bond stretches, so the bond length gets a little bit longer. Sometimes it's a bend where the bond angle changes, or sometimes it vibrates and things like that. But for the IB, we don't really care about that. Okay, we just care about whether it's absorbed or not. So the idea is that, and this is a small one, you don't have to draw this one big, but the idea is that this is measured as absorbance or transmittance. Now those are opposite. So like 100% absorbance is 0% transmittance, but regardless, the idea is that you have this kind of peak for absorbance. Okay, and so that peak tells you, okay, that bond, there's a bond present that's absorbing that infrared frequency. And we have a table that helps you identify what type of bonds might be present, okay? And these are the only bonds that the IB is going to hold you accountable for. So the IR purpose is to identify bonds present. It doesn't tell you how many of those bonds are present. It doesn't tell you like, um, not necessarily where those bonds are present, but it just tells you, okay, you have a C double bond O here, or you have an OH bond here. Now, it will kind of help you figure out what type of structure because some of the OH bonds are unique to certain classes of compounds. And so that can help you eliminate possible structures as well. But that's the main idea of IR spectroscopy. And so when you see IR spectroscopy, you see it for a molecule. Let me find a good one here. Okay. This is an example of an IR spectroscopy, okay, or an IR spectra. And this is of butan one all okay? And so again, the word stretch isn't really important for IB, but the idea is that these peaks that are being shown here represent certain bonds. And so you see this OH bond that's present here, that's a very broad, strong peak from about 3,200 to 3,400 or 3,600. And so you see, and I'm sorry, you can't really draw this, but you see this broad peak from about 3,200 to 3,600. And if you really wanna just use this value here, you could. Okay, you just use like the, the strongest absorbance and that will be your wavelength, um, your wave number, that's fine. Okay, so you see that OH bond due to alcohol. So this is an alcohol OH bond because if you notice here on this chart, there's two different OHs. There's an alcohol OH and there's a carboxylic acid OH and they have different values. And so it's important that you're able to distinguish between those. Carboxylic acid ones are a little bit trickier because they overlap that main um, C to H bond. So sometimes you'll see a little peak peeking out of this really strong broad peak. That's because it's a CH and the OH happening at the same time. I'll show you that in a little bit, okay? This is your kind of standard CH bonds that are present in all organic molecules, okay? And again, notice here, this CO stretch is unreliable because in that less than 1500, okay, area, what do we call that? Huh? Fingerprint. Fingerprint. Is that what you said? Okay. Yeah, my hearing's good, but not that good. Okay. Fingerprint region, okay? 
And we call it a fingerprint region because just like a fingerprint, each individual peak doesn't tell you enough information because there's such a lot of clutter in there. But the pattern overall can kind of help you identify what class of compound it is. And so we use it like a fingerprint because I know one loop or whirl or arch in your fingerprint is going to be able to identify you. But the combination of loops, whirls, and arches um, tells, um, helps you better identify the overall structure. Okay. So they'll ask you about that too. They'll be like, why are they unreliable in this section? That's because they're called the fingerprint region. Okay. Well, there's too many bonds that would absorb that. So that energy is absorbed by so many different bonds that you couldn't identify. What? Yes. Cool. Okay. For the record, that was Cass, hey, who can't read. <laughs> but true. Okay. So here you're really just analyzing an IR spectrum going, okay, what bonds are present? What bonds aren't present? So what is the IB going to ask you? They're going to ask you probably a couple things. They'll ask you, A, what bond is responsible for each of these peaks and they'll give you certain values or they'll say like on this ir and so you'll use the chart that's in your data booklet chart 26 to help you answer that question but two and this was on your practice test was what they might do is they might give you different structures and give you three irs and have you differentiate between which structure matches which ir and that's like a four or five mark question because you have to identify like, okay, unique peaks in each IR and how they relate to the structures overall. And so that's, that's another way that IB could ask that. And with, with that, you've got to make sure you cite the values in the data booklet. You know, I think that's one thing that students always forget is anytime the question says using this table, those values need to be in your answer somewhere. So if you're trying to say this IR matches this alcohol because of the OH, you would say this matches this structure because it has a hydroxyl or an OH group um, absorbance peak at about 3200 to 3600, which shows that you use the data booklet and shows you like what information you used from that data booklet to get your answer. So make sure you're citing values from the data booklet. Anytime they say use this table, you should be using those values in your answer. Okay. Also, a side note, um, this is not Chemistry exam is not, bless you, an English exam or other kind of questions. I know a lot of people are used to restating the question in their answer. Don't do it. It's a waste of time. Like the IB doesn't look for that. They just kind of ignore that part and just look for the right answer. So you don't need to restate the question in your answer. You're just wasting time. Just write the answer out. It doesn't even have to be a complete sentences. It just has to be there in the, with the right words and they'll take it. So don't feel like this is like, something you have to do in complete sentences or you have to restate the question because they still see the question when they're grading it. They don't just see your answer. They see the question and then your answer box. So they still know what the question is. So it's not like, a, oh, I need to read their answer and figure out what the question was. No, they still see it. So don't waste time re spending a sentence restating the question um, in your answer. Okay. I do have chat up. So if you type something in chat, I should see it immediately now. And if, if anyone has any questions. Okay. Questions about IR spectra. Okay, let me show you another one as well. I, I was gonna say, I was gonna show you a carboxylic acid one. Yeah, so this is an example of a carboxylic acid one. And so notice, that that OH is a lower value, but also the CH is kind of peaking outside of that. So you do have like two different peaks that are overlapping, but the CH bond is always going to be there. And so the OH is just a um, present here as well between that 2800. I think the IB says, excuse me, 2800 to 3200. Oh, there you go, 2500 to 3000. And so, the IB will make sure that their IRs re reflect that. So 
even if like different books say different values, the IR's values will reflect um, the IB's values in the data booklet will reflect their illustrations on the IR. Okay. Also notice here because there this is butanoic acid, so there are hexanoic acid. Excuse me, and so you'll see here. that presence of the C double bond O at 1700 as well. And so if you see an OH and a C double bond O, that should tell you that there is a carboxyl, carboxylic acid there. Because again, the IB limits you to one function group per structure. So there's never a time where you're gonna have a C double bond O like ketone somewhere and then a hydroxyl somewhere else. It, they're always gonna be in the same function group for the IB's concerns at least. Yes. Correct. Yeah, you can. Correct. Yes. You cannot use IR spectroscopy to see how many OH bonds or how many CH bonds you have. It's just, are they there or not? Yeah. The number of peaks don't matter. Correct. Yeah. Um, if, when you talk about it more in college, it does matter a little bit because um, the H's are slightly different. And so there is a little bit of shifting of the absorbance, but for the IV, no. The number of peaks only matters in HNMR which is what we're gonna talk about next. Okay, questions? Okay. I'm trying to think if there's anything else in IR. No, I think that's it. We're moving a little quicker than I thought, which is good. Okay, HNOR spectroscopy, okay. Use of magnetic field and radio waves to determine the environments of hydrogens and number of hydrogens in each environment. So HNMR is the most kind of involved one that actually can tell you the exact structure of the molecule given enough information. And so the HNMR is the most kind of inclusive one here is you're actually gonna know, okay, where are these hydrogens bonded um, and how many do I have in each, on each carbon and how are those carbons bonded to each other, okay? Now again, you don't need to know the science behind how HNMR works and like how you use radio, energy to re like um, reverse the spin of the hydrogens atoms in the molecule, but um, using a magnetic field also, but they produce data that you can use for this. So that's the idea. The environments and number of hydrogens in each environment is the purpose of HNMR spectroscopy. And it helps you eliminate certain isomers as well. Okay, because isomers most of the time have the same bonds um, within each other. And so now you actually have to look at how they're arranged in, um, the, um, in the molecule and in 3D space to help us figure this out. And so, okay, let's see. Let's see, how do I wanna do this? Okay, let's go with terms we need to know, okay? Okay, environment, okay? Um, hydrogens, that exhibit the same behavior based on their surroundings. Okay, so any hydrogen based on what they're neighboring and what they're surrounded by that are the same in a molecule are considered one environment. No, 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 that was just a statement. I just heard a noise, so I didn't know if that was a question or not. Okay. Two, neighboring hydrogens, okay. Um, these are described as hydrogens on 
adjacent carbons if if first hydrogen is bonded to a C, okay? So neighboring hydrogens only occur if the original hydrogen you're talking about is bonded to a carbon. If they're bonded to an oxygen, the oxygen kind of blocks any neighboring hydrogens from it. So if you're looking at environment and they're bonded to a C, then you look at the neighboring hydrogens on the neighboring carbons. And that tells you how many neighboring hydrogens you have. which then helps you understand the splitting pattern, okay? Which is the number of peaks an environment splits into based on neighbors plus one. Okay, so the splitting pattern is based on how many neighboring hydrogens it ha that environment has plus one. So if you have no neighbors, then you will have a splitting pattern of one, which is known as a singlet. If you have one neighbor, you'll have two, which is a doublet. Three is a triplet. Four is a quartet. I, I believe the IB says the maximum splitting pattern you need to name is quartet. But you could say, they could conceivably ask you, um, identify the number of peaks it would split into, and it could be any number, because that you don't need to know the name of that to be able to figure it out. Okay, the integrated trace, okay, it is a line that represents the area under a set of peaks or an environment, okay, it tells you the ratio of hydrogens in environments. So this is why you need a ruler because there might be a case where they show an HNMR and ask you to find the ratio of hydrogens in um, the environments in a molecule. So you'd have to measure that integrated trace line and compare them. Now, do your best to measure them, but here's a little tip. You'll know how many hydrogens that you have in your molecule by that time. So you'll know that the ratio between the lengths has to be a ratio that can add together to make them be a factor of the number of hydrogens. So for example, let's say you know you have eight hydrogens, right? And you measure and you get like one in four. Okay, that doesn't make sense because you have six, wait, did I say six hydrogens? Wait, what? Well, let's say you had six hydrogen in a molecule, but then you measure your lines, you got a ratio of one to four. Well, that doesn't make sense. So it's either probably one to five or two to four, and it's probably gonna be one to five because two to four would be almost like double the length. So it's probably one to five and not one to four. So kind of use a little bit of common sense with measurement because I've seen on the test, it's sometimes really hard to determine like, like, I think there's one on test where I measured it and it was like one to like eight, but there are only 10 hydrogens. So it had to be kind of one to nine, right? And so kind of use a little bit of common sense when you're measuring those because they're not perfect and your rulers aren't perfect either. So 
make sure that the ratio kind of makes sense with that. Okay. Now, last term. Wait, really? Yes. Well, actually, I guess there is one more term after that, but this is the last kind of major term. Chemical shift. Okay. The chemical shift helps identify the functional group responsible for the environment. Okay. So that there's a whole table of chemical shifts in your data booklet that help you tell what kind of environment that you're going to be present in. And so they have values and on the X axis, that will be your chemical shift in an NMR spectroscopy. And in the data booklet, they've bolded the hydrogens here to make sure that y'all could see it. This is a little snapshot here just to kind of show you what it looks like because the, the whole thing is like two pages long, so it's a little bit harder to see. That's not, that's amino acids, sorry. It looked very similar. Maybe I don't have this table in here. I'm starting to think I don't have it in here. Okay, I don't. Okay. Let me just switch over here so y'all can see it. So, when you scroll down here in topic 11, you'll see this HNMR data, which is table 27. And if you look really close, it's kind of hard to see sometimes, but they have an H bolded in this structure here, and that's the H they're talking about. So if you have an H on a, a CH3 group on the end of the molecule, it's going to shift about 0.9 to 1.0. If it's an H in a carbon in between two carbons, then it's going to be like 1.3 to 1.4. And you have different H's in a variety of manners here, right? An H on a benzene ring carbon attached to a benzene ring is 2.5 to 3.5. You know, you have a carboxylic acid here, which is 9 to 13. You have an ester hydrogen on the other side of the oxygen, which is like 3.7 to 4.8. And there are a couple on the last page, so don't forget that. There's like two on the last page that might be useful. Like, for example, the aldehyde hydrogen is 9.4 to 10, and the benzene hydrogen is... Um, 6.9 to 9.0. So really pay attention to these. Um, OH is also another one, 1 1.0 to 6. There's a wide range, but it, you can kind of use it to support your claims for different structures as well. So keep that in mind when you're looking at chemical shifts here. Now, don't forget, chemical shifts are relative to TMS, which is tetramethylsilane. Now, they tell you what the structure name is for TMS in the data booklet. So they're never going to ask you what does TMS stand for. They might, maybe they have you draw tetramethylsilane. S-I-L-A-N-E. I'm going to clean it up a little bit. Tetramethylsilane. Okay. That's what tetramethylsilane looks like. And if you notice, all these hydrogens are in the same environment because they're all identical. They're all connected to the same thing. And so it's one peak that is that the, that the machine uses to calibrate, and that's zero. So the peak at zero is always tetramethylsilane. There's never a hydrogen that's not part of that standard that is at zero. Okay. Questions? Oops, not, not all my photos. IB chemistry. You don't need to see what I had for lunch. Okay. Let's pull up a...
and a marsh spectra here, and we'll talk about it. Wait, where's my other? Oh, that's okay. That's fine. Okay. Okay. This is ethanol. Okay. Now, ethanol. Looks like this. Okay. Hopefully, y'all know that by now. Oh. <sighs> yeah, I would. Now, it doesn't have to be perfect, but like I do want, I would try to emulate, uh, make sure you emulate the peaks as best you can here. I'll zoom in here, and give y'all a second to copy this down. Yeah, make it four peaks, like two short ones and two taller ones in the middle. And the middle one is just one peak. And the, the one on the right is two short ones and one taller one in the middle. You don't need to make it very big. I think you just wanted to be able to reference it because we're gonna, we're gonna dissect the structure and explain why this NMR matches that structure. So you don't have to draw it big. And maybe jot the numbers underneath kind of roughly as well too. Oh yeah, sure. Um, the ratio is the ratio of hydrogens in each environment. So for example, in this one, which we're gonna talk about a little bit, the ratio is one to two to three or two to one to three or three to one to two or whatever, but that's the ratio of hydrogens in each environment. So if you have a ratio of one to two to three, you could have six hydrogens or you could have 12 hydrogens. The ratio is still one to two to three, but in reality, it's two to four to six, but that's a, still the same ratio of hydrogens. And so hopefully you'll see that when we apply this here, because when we look at this molecule here, how many environments do we see in this molecule? How many environments? That is a question, Alexandra. How many environments do we see in ethanol? Three, right, Cass. Where are the three environments? Just give me one environment. The CH3. Oops. Okay. Okay. Chloe, what's another one? The CH. Wait, wait, which one would you say? No, CH2, sorry. And then the last one, would be this H here. Okay. So we have three environments, okay? Does our spectra support that there are three environments? Yes, there's one environment here, there's one environment here, and there's one environment here. Now, I don't know which environment's which yet, which we're gonna talk about a little bit more, but I do know there's three sets of peaks, so that that does support the fact that there is three environments in this structure as well, okay? Now, the thing is this, okay? This environment, we'll call it A, we'll call this B, and we'll call this environment C, okay? In A, how many neighboring hydrogens do I have in A? How many neighboring hydrogens do I have in um, ethanol? Two. These two hydrogens are the neighboring hydrogens to that environment of CH3. So there's two neighbors. So therefore, what splitting pattern should you have? How many peaks should it split into? A triplet, three, or a triplet. Okay. The B environment has how many neighboring hydrogens? Chloe, three. Okay, so that means you have four, a quartet. And C has zero because it's on a oxygen. So it's gonna have a singlet. Okay. 
So are those splitting patterns represented in our diagram here? Yes, we have a quartet on the left here. We have a singlet in the middle, and then we have a triplet on the right. So again, double check. That's the second confirmation that these match each other. Okay. Now, yes. Correct. Yes, only neighboring C's to the C that the H is bonded to. Correct. Okay. Now, to kind of talk about Matthew's question about ratios here, well, we know that A has three hydrogens in it, and B has two hydrogens in it, and C has one hydrogen in that. So the ratio is, I mean, in any order you want, three to two to one. Wait, what? Okay, thank you. So what that means is your integrated traces should be three lengths compared to two lengths compared to one length. So whatever the one length is, if the one length is one centimeter, then the next length should be two and the next one should be three. Now, this diagram was nice enough to tell you what the ratio was already. Like the numbers up there, they told you this is a one to two to three ratio here. So that also checks out that the ratio of hydrogens in the structure matches that. And namely, that the ratio of three matches the, tr the triplet, the ratio of two matches the quartet, and the one matches the singlet. So all these pieces of information are kind of verifying this. And I'm doing it this way because I want you to think about all these things. You may not need all these things on the test, but these are possible ways that you can use to deduce the structure and try to come up and make sure that your structure is accurate. And I'll show you some tips and tricks as well as we go on today. Okay. Okay. Yes, Emma. Oh, they don't, that's a good question. They don't have the lines on here. So on yours, what they would do is something like this. The IB would provide a line next to this. That would be something like, it would look something like this. Like that. So you'd measure the vertical part of that line and you'd measure like, oh, this is, I don't know, let's say 0.5 centimeters and this is 1.0 centimeters and this is 1.5 centimeters. Well, then that's the ratio of one to two to three. So the lengths are the ratios. Okay. Now, the last thing that you should consider is chemical shift. Okay. And what that means is when you look at an environment, you need, to look, oops, you need to look at if the shift is relatively close to what the data booklet says. Now, these aren't perfect, but you do get kind of the idea here. If you look at a CH3 group, like that's in environment A, it should shift from 0 0.9 to about 1.0. Is it a little bit higher than that? Yeah, but it's not significant. Like this is like 1.2, 1.3. So, okay, that's, that verifies that. If you look at an OH, that should be between one and six. So that is also correct. And if you look at a H on a carbon next to an OH. That one's kind of tricky, but if you look there and you try to find, it would be something like this, okay? The R being an H, 
and the hydrogen being on the carbon next to that. So 3.3 to 3.7. That also matches the shift that we're looking for here. So all this stuff, of course, we knew it was going to match up, but this is the stuff you should be thinking about. Number of environments, splitting pattern, shifts, integrated traces. These are the four components of an NMR that you need to consider when you're trying to go, okay, does this structure make sense? Or what is this NMR telling me about the structure? Yes, Ethan. Oh, no, no, no. That, that it, well, it's not a physical shift. It's a shift in the radio waves that are being detected. That's what they mean by shift. And so, like, that energy that's being um, absorbed and stuff like that is being shifted kind of along the x axis. So yeah, the, the atoms themselves are not shifting in the molecule. Yes, yeah. Okay. All right, questions about that? Okay. So a couple of tips and tricks that I've thought about going over this um, that I think might help y'all. Okay. Sorry, does everyone have this down? I know it's a lot of stuff. Okay. This will be in the Dropbox as well. It's called Saturday Session Topic 11 and 21. So if you want to cut out diagrams from this and paste them into your notes and stuff like that, you're more than welcome to do that. Or copy and paste them and put them in your HL or SL review document. That's okay too. Okay. So I would say kind of helpful hints, tips and tricks. Okay. One of them that I would say is this, okay? And this is, I think, a big one, okay? You can only have more than three hydrogens in an environment. Oops. If there is some form of symmetry okay so whether it's branching or like kind of end-to-end -end symmetry that's the only way you're going to get an environment that has more than three hydrogens so that's what you should be thinking about you should be thinking about okay there must be at least two carbons that have hydrogens that are the same okay So for example, like if you have something like this, these hydrogens are the same because they're symmetry because they both neighbor the same environment, same type of environment, I should say. This would still be true if you had something like this. Even though they're not neighboring the same environment, they're neighboring identical environments. So those are both um, the same environment. And also you can have branching as well. Oh, sorry. Like if you have this, these are in the same environment. So branching or mirror images across the kind of vertical plane, those are kind of where you have environments with more than three hydrogens. So think about that, especially like on the test, the, um, the mock exam, students were kind of struggling trying to come up with that structure because they had a scenario where there was two environments and one had one and the other had nine. And that nine number should tell you like, well, okay, I have, the structure was, I believe, C4, wait, C4, actually, I don't even, did they even tell you, I think they just told you C5, H10, O2, okay? And based on previous knowledge, you knew you had a COH somewhere. Okay. That also makes sense because this H is that one um, hydrogen in that own environment. 
that means all other nine hydrogens had to be in the same environment. So there had to be some symmetry there. So you have this. And then what must be true here is that they must all be the same. And that's how you get nine. Here is it. So when you get a number greater than three, there's branching or like symmetry of, across the molecules somewhere that is causing you to be able to do that. Okay, so that's kind of one big kind of tip for that. Is that if you see a number greater than three in your ratio, there has to be some kind of CH3 group or some kind of symmetry that's occurring. I guess I should say like, you could also have something like this, where like, well, in these here, this environment is also the same, right? So there's four hydrogens there. So there's some kind of symmetry that's occurring for this. And isomers get different number of environments and different number of structures because like, for example, if you, if you looked at this structure here, and let's say students were trying to do this. Okay. That is an isomer. It's C5H10O2. But this has a lot more environments. This has one environment here. One environment here, one environment here, one environment here, and one environment here. This has five different environments because even though those are CH2s, those CH2s are next to different things. So they have a different environment as a whole. So just because they say CH2 doesn't mean that they're identical. CH2s can be different environments as well. So that structure, the linear version, has five different environments with a very, very different ratio of, um, of hydrogen in each environment. That would be one, two, 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 three. So you'd have a lot more sets of peaks than you would in that one to nine. Yes, there are two environments in this one on the left. These nine are in one environment and this H is the other environment. That's why the ratio. So another thing is if you have the ratio, the integrated trace ratio, the numbers you have is the number of environments you have, right? So if it's one to nine, that tells you there's two environments. If it's one to two to two to two to three, that's five environments. So that's another tip as well. You should have the same number of numbers in your ratio as you do environments. If you don't, then you did something wrong. Questions. Okay. Yes. Correct. Yeah, because you do not count neighboring hydrogens like that are in the same environment. So yeah, this has zero neighbors. And so does the other one. So if you saw the NMR for this, which I think you had, It'd be two singlets. Tip two. If you have a quartet, you're next to a CH3, right? Let me just make sure my, my saying that right. Uh, most likely. I think there's like some rare instances, but usually when you have a quartet, you're next to a CH3. If it doesn't work out, then reevaluate. But for the most part, if you're 
got a quartet, there's probably a CH3 next to that hydrogen. Because that's your three neighboring hydrogens. I guess there are some kind of weird instances where you might have like, no, actually, I'm not even sure if there's, a, I don't think with maybe, I don't think with IB level of difficulty that you'd have those kind of issues. Okay. Three. Um, Symmetrical molecules have fewer environments than carbons. Okay, so I guess this tip is kind of a, oh, I'm trying to figure out the structure. Well, I only have two environments, but I have four or five carbons. That kind of tells you that you probably ha should have some kind of symmetry somewhere in this, whether it's horizontal symmetry or vertical symmetry, there needs to be some kind of branching or symmetry about it because if it's asymmetrical, you're gonna have almost guaranteed the same number of environments as you do carbons. Kind of like what we we're saying here, right? With this diagram here, that this asymmetrical carbon has five carbons and five environments, right? But when you have fewer than five environments and you have five carbons, there has to be some kind of symmetry that's allowing your environments to be the same on two or more carbons. So that's kind of another thing that you can kind of think about. It's like, well, I only have two environments, but I have five carbons. Well, it's either perfectly symmetrical or I have branching that makes things the same. And you can't be perfectly symmetrical with an, a carboxylic acid. So that kind of supports that as well. Questions? Okay. But yeah, so that's NMR. So NMR is kind of the most complicated one that has a lot of different factors, but if you know what you're looking for, it should be pretty straightforward and marks wise and things like that. Because most of the mass spec and the IR spec, all you can do is ask like, what kind of fragments do you make or what kind of peaks are observed and stuff like that. But with NMR, you can be like, well, how many environments does it have? Or what's the integrate, what's the ratio of hydrogens? You know, what's the splitting pattern? What's the final structure of this molecule? So, but all three kind of work together to do, um, to help you determine the structure of a molecule. And usually on the IB exam, they'll give you all three. If they're trying to do an unknown kind of formula that you're trying to figure out. Okay. Last analytical technique that we're gonna talk about really quickly and then we'll take a break, okay. X-ray crystallography, okay. Again, you don't actually have to know how to analyze it because that technique is actually in one of the options that, um, that you'd have to look at. So you don't actually have to understand like how to calculate X-ray crystallography. But what you need to know is X-ray crystallography helps you determine the bond lengths and angles of an organic molecule. Kind of simply put, what they do is they get a solid version of it, a solid version of the chemical. And that means it's gonna form a repeating crystal lattice. And what they do is they shine x-rays off of it. And those x-rays bounce off the atoms. And then you can find the bond length and the angles that are created between the structure here. So extra crystallography is just, you just need to know that it's used to, for, to, to deduce bond angles and bond lengths in a structure. So it bounces off the atoms and it helps you figure out the bond lengths and the bond angles based on how the x-rays bounce off those atoms. Okay. 
the distance between the two rays, right? So when the rays bounce off, the distance between those two is the bond length. But you don't even have to know that much, to be honest with you. You just need to know that it determines bond length and angles. If you're curious, I believe it's an option A, which is the analytical, and it talks about like the angle and the, the calculating the distance and stuff like that. Okay. All right. Let's take like a 10 to 15 minute break. We'll resume back at 10.35, and then we'll talk about the other kind of basics. I think we may be able to finish early today, so that's some good news. All right, I'm gonna pause recording. Okay, so that is the end of organic analytical chemistry. Now what we're gonna talk about is more of kind of the fundamentals of chemistry, and we talked about this a little bit in class, but I did want to take a little more time because we have time to kind of flesh things out a little bit more in regards to things like accuracy, precision, significant figures, um, uncertainty, and stuff like that. And so a couple of concepts here, okay? So just a reminder, because I know sometimes you get inundated with all this like higher level chemistry stuff that you forget uh, just for these definitions, probably just a couple of lines and then you can kind of move on. So sometimes you lose track of these kind of fundamental things of like accuracy, precision, and random and systematic error and stuff like that. So I want to kind of go over that here. Accuracy is the closeness a measurement is to an accepted value. Okay. And so when you say something is accurate, that means like if you put a kilogram mass on a scale and it reads one kilogram, that's accurate. Okay. And the way you measure that is percent error. So the way you calculate accuracy is you look at percent error. Okay. <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, so percent error is calculated by okay experimental minus theoretical or the accepted value over theoretical. Experimental is the one you collect data on. Theoretical is the calculator or the known, like the accepted value. Yes. So you're always solving for the experimental and theoretical is um, given to you. So like if you want to, if you're you calculating your percent error of the enthalpy combustion, you would look at the data booklet for the, the theoretical value and you'd calculate the experimental. Okay. So this is how far it is off the accepted value. So you measure percent error that way. Some people just do percent yield and subtract it from one. That's the same thing. Like if you find the percent yield and then you do one minus that decimal, then that's fine too. But, oh, um, like let's say you find an 85% yield. Your percent error is 15% then, right? Because if you had a 100% yield, it'd be exactly right. So then it'd be 15% off. So uh, I, uh, I guess, yes. Um, percent yield, I guess, on the multiple choice, you could also be expected to do that. And that's just experimental over theoretical times 100. And like Alexandra said, the theoretical would be given to you in the problem. It has to be given to you in the problem. Okay. Um, I think percent yield and percent error are mostly with like topic one stoichiometry and stuff like that. Like here's your reaction, calculate your theoretical yield using stoichiometry. Actually, wait, hold on a second. I guess what I said with Alexandra about theoretical isn't necessarily true. Because if you're doing a reaction, they'll give you the experimental value in the problem and you'll have to calculate the theoretical. Like. Like if you have X amount of reactants and you're reacting, when you calculate how much product you should make, that's your theoretical value, Alexandra. So like if you're calculating for hypothetically what would happen when it, it all completely reacts, that's your theoretical yield. So don't necessarily say the value given in the problem is a theoretical, I should say. So like if they say like this reactant combusts and the, the, the experiment found that this was the mass that was collected, that's your experimental yield. 
So be careful with the wording there, I guess. Now, yeah, if you're trying to calculate how much product is being made, that is theoretical. Okay. Now, accuracy relates to systematic error. Oh, yeah, Matthew. Can percent you'll be in real life, it shouldn't be over 100%. But you have other factors in like labs that it might cause it to be over 100%. So I don't think the IB would ever have a case. But if they did, then they might suggest why is it over 100%. But like, like, for example, sometimes when you collect a product and it's like wet and you have to let it dry, if you don't let it dry all the way, the mass can appear to be higher than it actually is because the water's still in there. So your percent yield might look over 100%. So I guess. Technically, it could be, but generally, they try not to. Okay. Okay. So, systematic error. Okay. Errors in procedure that affect the accuracy of the experiment. Okay. So, this is something that is causing your um, your value to be off in your procedure. And so, so it doesn't matter how many times you repeat the experiment, you're still gonna be off by this. So repeat trials do not help. Repeating trials does not help systematic error. Yeah, we're we're gonna do that. Okay. What a great idea, Alexander. I wish I thought of that. Okay. So examples of systematic error. Okay. Now you have to be careful though, because sometimes systematic errors end up not being errors to begin all um at all, because depending on how you're using those values to calculate, it may not matter. So for example. Non zeroing a scale. Okay. Because let's say you don't have it at zero, then your mass is going to be off either too high or too low, but it's going to be consistently too high or too low. And that's another thing with systematic error, it's always too high or it's always too low in these issues. But here's the thing though not an error when calculating the change right because if your scale is off the same way both times at the final and the initial the difference is still going to be the same so it's not an error when you're calculating the change of mass because if you don't zero it and you you have the same effect on both values then it cancels each other out so you have to be careful that sometimes what you imagine as a systematic error may not actually have the effect you intend yes correct you're assuming that you didn't zero the scale in between two or the sensitivity didn't change and stuff like that. You're assuming that it's the same instrument overall. Okay. Okay. Um, another one is like um, reading a burette not at eye level. Okay. And that's one of the things that, especially when you get into college, when you do titrations in lab is that Understanding that if you look at a burette and the meniscus, you want to be eye level to read it correctly. Because the thing is, if you aren't at eye level, if you're like too low like this, what you have to understand is that you're going to see this value when you read across like that. Okay, and so it's going to affect the value that you're reading. It's, if you're too low, it's going to be too high. The value is going to appear higher. If you're too high, then it's going to look like it's lower. And so really important that you make sure that your eye level. Okay. 
Now, again, if you're doing titration, then um, it doesn't matter because you're doing the difference in volume in a titration. So it doesn't matter if you're doing that. So not an error when it's changed. Yes, Alexander. Are you um, no, human errors are what we call mistakes. So like if you overfill something or you spill something moving out of it, those are mistakes and you should invalidate the trial immediately. We're assuming that like these are technique things that you're doing incorrectly that affect your data. Another thing. Not drying a sample completely. Okay. And so because water adds mass and that's going to affect your value in this. The proper technique is to dry until mass is unchanged. So like if you have a sample of powder that's wet and you're heating up to dry and then you're massing it, you don't stop until the mass stops changing because if it keeps changing, that means there's still water left over. So you heat, dry, I mean heat, cool, mass, heat, cool, mass, heat, cool, mass until the two masses don't change because when they don't change, then you can assume it's completely dry. Okay. Or even four, this is the last example we'll do here, unless I think of another one that's major. But it's like um, leaving water in burette before filling. Okay. What happens if you leave excess water in the burette before you fill it with an acid or a base? How does that affect it, Alexandra? Uh, okay, how do we measure that? Yes, Kath. How does that affect it? How does leaving water in the bureau before you fill it with a... Yes, that's not. Okay, you're on the right track. It's going to affect the concentration. So what it's going to do is it's going to dilute the titrant. Okay? which means it has a lower concentration than, inspect, than expected. Which means you're gonna end up using more of it than you should be, but you're not gonna know that the concentration is down, so you're gonna use the concentration you think it is, and that's gonna throw off your values. So when you leave water in a burette, you're gonna dilute that acid or base, and therefore you're gonna think it's 0.1 molar, but it's really 0 0.09 molar. And you're going to be titrating with 0 0.09 when you think it's 0 0.1. So leaving water in the burette dilutes the titrate. Therefore, the, lower, the concentration is lower than you think it is. But the problem is you don't know that. So you treat it as the concentration that you believe it is. And then your volume is going to be too high. So things like that, those are kind of techniques that can cause you to have issues with your experiment. And these are things that you should be able to, I guess, if you're really if you're calling these errors yes it's it's user error in this when you're kind of conducting the experiment but it's not a mistake well i guess like i think a mistake is something obvious that is going to affect your data like it spills or like like this is kind of technique procedural things but like if you spill something or you like don't stir or don't mix completely those are kind of more mistakes than human errors You had three, Chloe? Okay. Now, precision is the repeatability of measurements. So precision actually has nothing to do with how close you are to the actual value. It's just a, does this instrument give me the same value every time it's measured? It doesn't matter if it's accurate or not. It's just, is it repeatable? 
if I put a one kilogram mass on a scale and I get 0.5 every single time, that's a precise scale. It's repeatable. It's not accurate, but it is precise. Okay. And this tends to be with the significant figures of an instrument. Okay, and this therefore leads to, no, it doesn't matter, uncertainty. So accuracy percent error by precision is uncertainty. How uncertain are you of the values that you're measuring? Um, not how accurate are they, just how uncertain, like what is the range of error in your measurements? That's what precision measures. So that's the plus or minus of every instrument you read and how does that value kind of propagate throughout the your calculations and stuff like that. So accuracy is percent error, precision is significant figures and uncertainty. Okay. And so that's where you talk about something that's like 1.00 centimeters cubed versus 1.0 centimeters cubed plus or minus 0.05 plus or minus 0 0.5, okay? So technically you're measuring the same value, but the, this one is more precise because the repeatability of it allows you to be within five hundredths of a centimeter cubed instead of five tenths of a centimeter cubed. So you're much more sure that it's closer to one centimeter cubed on the left one than on the right one. And this is what we call our absolute uncertainty. Like the value plus or minus attached to a, in its, um, to a measurement to show the measurement, the, the tool's uncertainty. Now, if we wanted relative uncertainty or percent uncertainty, we would do the uns absolute uncertainty divided by the measurement. And we'd find it's plus or minus 5% of that measurement. Whereas this one is 50% uncertain. So that measurement you have could be either 0.5 or 1.5. Very, very significant difference in how those values relate to each other. And so this is why when you're doing small measurements, you want very precise equipment because you have so small amount of it that if you use a less precise instrument, you're gonna have way too much uncertainty. And also when you're designing labs, if you're limited to imprecise equipment, you wanna use larger samples. Because remember, it's not just the uncertainty that affects your relative uncertainty, but it's also the measurement itself. So if you had an instrument that only measures plus or minus 0.5, you wouldn't measure only one centimeter cubed in it. You try to measure 10 or 50 or 100 centimeters cubed where the 0.5 is less of an impact than it is when you're only measuring one centimeter cubed out. So it is something that you want to think about when you're designing as well, that the amount of sample that you're measuring would also benefit from that precision if it was a larger amount. questions. And that's what significant figures mean because a significant figure literally means that you are it's significant because you are measuring it off that instrument. And so the reason why this has three significant figures is because your instrument was measuring one and then I guess I don't even know how to um, demonstrate this, but like it's measuring this. So you knew at least it was 1.0 and then you estimated another digit, which is point, which is zero, because anything you estimate is better than not estimating at all. So that's why you always estimate a digit when you're measuring instruments. Because that gives you, like, that estimate is still a moment of precision in there. Whereas 
oh sorry would be one two and zero and that would be this so you know for sure one and then you're estimating the point zero so notice how different the precision is there So every time a, a, a measurement puts a zero somewhere at the end of the number, it matters because what they're telling you is I measured all the way to the hundreds, it just happened to be a zero, okay? And that's okay, but there's a deliberate reason for why you put those zeros and that's what makes them significant. The person is telling you that with this value 1.00 is that I measured to the hundreds, but it just happened to be exactly 1.00. It could have been 1.01, .01, it could have been 1.02, but the fact that you wrote that zero there tells you that it could be any of those numbers. This student tells you that they measured to the tenths and it couldn't be 1.01, .01. it couldn't be 1.02, .01. it can only be 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3, 0 0.9, 0 0.8. So there is a smaller range of error here. So significant figures do matter. And also, as a side note, if you're never if you're not sure how to write the number of significant figures that you want the best way to do it is scientific notation okay and that's what i've kind of told my students in the past is that if you want three significant figures and you're not sure how to do it write in scientific notation because every time you write it all these digits are significant no matter what digits you write zero through nine, they're all significant. So if you're not sure, write it that way. Like for example, let's say you get like, like let's say you get 40,000 and you're trying, not that the IV would do this, but let's say you're trying to write, like, well, how do I do three significant figures here? Um, the best way to do it is write it as 4.00 times 10 to the fourth. That has three significant figures always. So that eliminates the pressure of having to go, okay, how do I write all these zeros and show it's significant and still show the same quantity or value that I want? So scientific notation is kind of a hack there. Like that makes sure that you do it right. It may look silly, but it's always right. And the IB can't take off for it if you write a number in scientific notation. <laughs> even if you write, even if it's like 1.34 and you write 1.34 times 10 to the zero, at least it's right, you know, huh? Oh, what? <laughs> no, come on. Like, it's just them trying to show, because I would say there's always one question on the entire test on paper two that says, write your answer to the correct significant figures. So like, you have to do that. The rule of thumb is every other problem, if you stay to three significant figures, you should be okay. Because they give you one significant figure either direction. Like you can have two or four for your answer and you're still okay. So. Just stick to three, that's generally a good rule of thumb. Okay. Now remember, um, when you're adding and subtracting significant figures, I know like one class talked about this in class, but the other classes didn't get to it. So that's okay. I want to go over here. And again, I'm perfectly fine with repeating stuff over and over again. Y'all got to get used to it in this next coming month. Okay. So adding and subtracting using significant figures, you go by the least precise place value. Okay. So the least number of decimal places in one way. I like to write it vertically to minimize my mistakes. So if I have 4.5 minus 2.64, I think it's harder to see it this way, but if I write it this way and line up everything, I type this in the calculator, I get 1.96, but I have to stop at the tenths because my first measurement's limited to the tenths. So my answer ends up being 2.0. That's as as sure as I can be of that difference in measurement is 2.0. Because it's 1.9 and the 6 rounds up, so it's 
If it was 1.94, then it'd be 1.9. But you do round using that second digit, that last digit after the, the break. So I just write it vertically just to kind of help visualize the um, place values. When you multiply and divide significant figures, you go by least number of significant figures because the place values don't have any value in units that have different units, in, value, in measurements that have different units. So you can't just say, oh, this is tenths and this is hundredths. Well, a tenth of a gram is not the same as a hundredth of a centimeter cubed. And so um, you actually have to go by significant figures there. So when you do like, 3.0 times 4.24, even though your calculator says 12.72, you can only have two significant figures, so your answer ends up being 13. Yeah, 12.72. I just want to make sure I, I did that right in my head. Questions about that? Okay. Adding and subtracting using uncertainties. So if you have uncertainties on values that you're adding and subtracting, you add the absolute uncertainties. So in that previous problem, it was 4.5 plus or minus 0 0.5 minus 2.64 plus or minus 0 0.05. Your answer is 1.96 plus or minus 0 0.55. That means it's 2.0 plus or minus 0 0.6 because everything should match place value wise with your uncer absolute uncertainty and your actual measurement. So it'd be 2.0 plus or minus 0.6. When you multiply and divide absolute uncertainties, you have to add your relative uncertainties. Because again, when you're dealing with different units, those units, absolute uncertainties, don't relate to each other in the correct way. So finding the relative uncertainty of each measurement does allow you to kind of have a uniform, like if this is 10% off and this is 10% off, then your final answer is gonna be 20% off. So like if you have, like 3.0 plus or minus 0 0.1 times 4.24 plus or minus 0 0.01, you would do 0 0.1 over 3.0 plus 0 0.01 over 4.24 times 100 would get you your uncertainty. Let me find out what that is. So point one divided by three point zero plus four point two four gets you three point five seven percent. So your value is off by 3.57%. Oh, I just realized something. <laughs> Even if I freeze this for this, if I try to scroll through my iPad, the people on the Zoom are gonna see anyway, so it doesn't really matter. 
So. Yes. So it would be 13 plus or minus 3.57% or 3.6%. The place value doesn't matter. My general rule of thumb is you round a, a tenth if it's greater than two and round a hundredth if it's less than two percent, but I don't think the IB is gonna take off. Like for that type of problem, they'll probably make it as a multiple choice question and then like there's only one answer that's suitable. So you just choose that. That's what I'm saying. Like you don't necessarily follow like the significant figures for percentages. Yeah. So like in my honest, like in the way I usually do it, I teach it as I round it to two um, significant figures. If it's like greater than 2% and if it's less than 2%, I do two decimal places. But I don't think the IB is going to take off for that. They're going to kind of give you an answer choice there. Huh? Yeah, I think it's, I should, it should be fine. Let me double check something really quickly. Because is it this one? That's the one I wanted. Okay, hold on a second. I'm gonna this thing. Oh, actually, that's not super important for this year, because there's not like. Oh, that's that's what I wanted to talk about. Is that the only thing? I thought there was more stuff. I wanted to talk about. Hold on a second. No, we already talked about that. Okay. Oh, I guess they talk about IHD, but whatever. It will be fine. Index of hydrogen efficiency. You know, like where you figure out like the value for unsaturation and stuff like that. I just want to make sure. Let's see. Okay, that's fine. We did that already. Did that. Did that. Did I even just skip graphing and stuff like that this year? Okay. Let's talk about a couple of different things on here, on, on the graphical things as well. Okay. Wait, did I have, hold on a second. Is it sketch versus drawn? Okay, I just want to show. Oops, that's the wrong one. Okay, sketch a graph versus draw a graph. Okay, sketch a graph has no ax no no um, values on axes, and it's more of a qualitative graph, meaning that. You're just showing the relative like relationship between two things, but they're not, no one should be able to read the values off your drawing to say, oh, that's this value is this value and things like that. So like things like gas law relationships, like showing that pressure and volume have an inverse relationship or like volume and temperature have a linear relationship in Kelvin, by the way. Okay, if it's in Celsius, it shifts over because it doesn't intersect at zero, zero. Okay. Things like Maxwell Boltzmann, okay, where you have kind of that curve here. Again, you're not being graded on how exactly accurate your curve is, it's just a general shape, okay. And notes here, this is a um, inverse relationship. This is a direct relationship. You can make inverse relationships direct by changing the axes. So for example, 
if I have an inverse relationship, if I make one of my axes inverse, then it becomes a direct relationship. So understand that you can convert an inverse relationship into a linear relationship if you change one of the axes to reflect that inverse. So then now they're directly related in that manner. So there is that kind of idea between that. Now, drawn graphs have actual units um, and intervals and labels, okay? So this is more for like rate of reaction, like y'all saw on y'all's test where you had actual lines and you had to plot points in that. Now, okay. Line of best fit. Generally speaking, the line of best fit should start at zero, zero. It doesn't have to go through every point. It just needs to do its best attempt to be near all the points as best as possible. Okay. And like, if they ask you to calculate the slope, they understand that there's some variation in how you draw your best fit line. So like, they'll give you a range of acceptable answers. But you really need to pay attention to these intervals because they will change these intervals up and change the units of the axes up to make sure that you're paying attention. Like maybe you're going by hundreds instead of 20s or 60s or whatever, make sure you're paying attention to the points. I had a lot of, I had a few kids when they were graphing it, they put all their points, but they miscounted like how many lines and how many like ticks it was to a certain value. And they, one of their points is off and then that makes their graph wrong. Okay. For a higher level, You might have something like the Arrhenius equation, where you've got that natural log of k versus 1 over t. And you're having to read the graph off of a gridded chart to try to figure out what the activation energy is. Oh, sorry. Negative Ea over Rt is equal to the slope of that line. And pay attention to the units of this to make sure that you have the right difference in values there. Maybe it's times 10 to negative three, maybe it's not, but you have to pay attention to those units. So make sure you're reading your grid lines correctly and that your intervals are correct as well. Units, one over T. Because for the radius equation, it's graphing natural log versus one over T. That's that natural log of K is equal to negative EA over RT plus LN of A. That's like the last thing we learned. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, okay. I think you try your best, but it's not the end of the world. It's like one point on the other side or not. No, no, you should draw your line best fit and then calculate the slope of that line. Don't, you shouldn't be using any points on that line and things like that. Huh?
Wait, what do you mean blindly draw? No, no, no. Like, because I thought what Laura was asking about was like, do you use the points and find the average points to try to figure out like the slope? No, you draw this line and you calculate the slope of that line, ignoring the points after you draw the best fit line. Oh, no, no. I, I've never said that before. Yes. No, but like Laura's saying in different classes that they were taught different ways to do the best fit line. And so like um, in her class last year, they averaged all the Y values and averaged all the X values and put that point and made sure it was on the best fit line. Never thought about that. Yeah, so I think even if you're a little bit off by that, your slope should still fall within the range of acceptable values for chemistry. I've never, I've never heard that before, but maybe that's just me. I guess that could help, but I feel like it's okay. It's fine. I'm glad there's no video being shown on my facial expression right now. Okay. All right. So making sure that you know how graphs look and um, there is there is a video already called charts and graphs um, and tables. I don't know if I wrote oh my on it, but um, in the in the YouTube videos already. So we talk I talk about outlining every single graph, every single table, every single chart that you might be um, discussing on the IB exam. So you'll see some of these graphs sketched a little bit more to detail and more information on each of these graphs to make sure that you are sketching them correctly. I think that's it. I think that's where we're gonna stop for today in the analytical chemistry for topic 11 and 21.